day to all of you. So we're already on our last chapter for the Operating Systems Lecture Series. So we have Chapter 21, Windows 10. Actually, it's a case study which, of course, um, obviously it deals with the features and characteristics of Windows 10 as an operating system. So without further ado, let's start our lesson. So again, Chapter 21 is all about Windows 10, the latest uh, OS uh, version of Microsoft. So the contents of Chapter 21 is we have the history, design principle, system components, terminal services and fast user switching, file system, networking, and programmer interface. So the objectives of this chapter is to explore the principles upon which Windows 10 is designed and the specific components involved in the system. Another objective is provide a detailed explanation of the Windows 10 file system. Next is illustrate the networking protocol supported in Windows 10. Describe the interface available in Windows 10 to system and application programmers. And last but not the least, describe the important algorithms implemented in Windows 10. So for the history, so in 1988, Microsoft decided to develop a new technology or NT. It's a portable operating system that supported both the OS slash 2 and POS 6 APIs or application programming interface. Then OS 2 is operating system slash 2. And then originally, NT was supposed to use the OS slash 2 API as its native environment, but during development, NT was changed to use the Win32 API, reflecting the popularity of Windows 3.0. So many versions of Windows along the way, which includes XP, Vista, 7, 8, and now 10. Actually, aside from these um, versions, there are earlier versions such as, so of course we have Windows 3.0, then we have Windows 95, That's uh, it's 95 because um, it was released 1995, and then three years after, we have Windows 98. Okay, of course, it is released uh, in 1998. And then we also have the Windows ME edition. So ME means Millennium Edition. So it's in the year 2000. And then after that is we have the XP and then the Vista, which for me, as I can remember, Windows Vista looks exactly like Windows 7. It has a code name of Longhorn, if I'm not mistaken. Um, uh, again, let's return. Vista and 7 almost have the same um, graphical user interface. The problem with Vista is that it's a resource hugger. So it's very slow. Actually, uh, Windows 7 is an improved version of Windows Vista. And then let's continue along with this um, versions of Windows. And of course, the latest is Windows 10. Many older versions still in use, less secured, some unpatched. So for Windows XP and Windows 7, um, they're already not supported by Microsoft for the updates because, of course, they're already concentrating with uh, Windows 10 with regards to its patches. And then, of course, we have the Windows 10, again, the latest OS of uh, uh, Microsoft Windows. So 32 and 64-bit preemptive multitasking operating system for Intel microprocessors. So specifically, it is for Intel microprocessors. So key goals for the system is we have portability, security, POS 6 compliance, multiprocessor support, extensibility, and then we also have international support, compatibility with MS-DOS and MS Windows applications. So as you can remember, DOS is disk operating systems. And of course, for of course Windows is um, it will support um, Windows-based applications. And Windows 10 also uses a microkernel architecture, and then several versions with different. Um, prices for devices or laptops or desktops and servers of course for windows 10 so let's just take for example we have windows 7 at the time we have this version for windows 7 we have the windows 7 ultimate then we have the windows 7 professional then for windows 8 and windows 10 we have single language um, versions 
So actually, uh, the prices it depends upon if you have a professional version of uh, of Windows, for example, for Windows 10. So it's more expensive than Windows 10 Home. So we have different version depending on the needs of the user. And then Windows 10 has an App Store. So actually, it started with Windows 8, and then Windows 10 has already um adapted the app store uh there are also versions of uh, ms windows applications uh, uh metro version or metro applications and then windows desktop bridge to run older binaries or executable files and then we have pico for providers replacing the old multiple subsystem concept hyper v virtualization of course it supports for um, if you want to run a virtual machine manager such as the VMware player and VirtualBox, it is also a uh, multi-user. It also has distributed services, remote graphical user interface, and other advanced features. So the design principles, again, of Windows 10 for security. So Windows 10 uses the access control lists or ACLs, um, as we have already discussed all about security in the previous chapters. So it is both attribute-based and claim-based. And then we also have rudimentary capabilities functionally called integrity levels. For security, example, if you are a guest, you can only view files, but you cannot install programs inside uh, Windows if, if you are a guest. But of course, if you, have, if you are an admin, if you have an admin account, then you can do everything that you want with the system. And then file system and communication encryption. So uh, for Windows 10, they also use this exploit mitigation such as the address space layout randomization or, or the ASLR. So ASLR, is it, it is an OS technique to avoid code injection attacks that place memory objects like the stack and heap at unpredictable locations. Then we also have data execution prevention control flow guard or the CFG and arbitrary code guard ACG. These are actually Windows 7 features that is still adapted in Windows 10. And then also uh, for security, they have several digital signature facilities. And then we have the device guard option for fine grain control over what signer's code is allowed on the system. So we also have extensibility. So it is a layered architecture for Windows 10. So it uses remote procedure calls and advanced local procedure calls. So ALPC is a method used for communication between two processes on the same machine. So for portability, Windows 10 can be moved from one hardware architecture to another with relatively few changes. So because uh, it is written in C and C++, Processor-specific portions are written in assembly language for a given processor architecture. So because it is written um, uh, in, in assembly language, it requires a small amount of such code. And of course, the code are very small in size. And then platform-dependent code is isolated in a dynamic link library or DLL called the hardware abstraction layer or HAL, which will be discussed later. So next is we have reliability. So Windows 10 uses hardware protection for virtual memory and software protection mechanisms for operating system resources. And then for compatibility, applications that follow the IEEE 1003.1, the POSIX standard, can be complied to run on Windows 10 without changing the source code. And in terms of performance, uh, Windows 10 subsystems can communicate with one another via high performance message passing. So for message passing, preemption of low priority threads enables the system to respond quickly to external events. And also Windows 10 is also designed for symmetrical multiprocessing. Another design principle is international support. Supports different locales via the national language support or L. NLS API. So actually gone are the days of the Windows version in which it only supported English because of course the character system that is used at the time is ASCII or um, actually the ASCII 
uh, it only represented the uh, English alphabet. But now, because of Unicode, um, Windows can support other languages if you're going to install additional language packs so that your computer can recognize. Actually, Windows 10 can already um, recognize different languages uh, written in, of course, in different writing systems. But if you want to enjoy, for example, how to write, how to write a specific um, character or a specific language, you need to download language pack. So for this system, the computer that I've been using, I've installed language packs for um, Japanese and Korean. Um, for Japanese, of course, I know how to read and write Japanese. And then for Korean, uh, because I just want to learn, uh, I'm not yet well versed with, uh, with, uh, with their handwriting system, which is Hangul. But of course, I, I want to learn so that I have, I, I want to learn many languages, of course. So let's see. Uh, for an example, for, for Windows 10, if it really supports languages. So, from here, we have um, English, of course. That's the default language for any Windows. Unless, of course, uh, we are here in the Philippines. So, the, the default is English. Actually, um, English is Philippines. Uh, actually, it does not matter if it's United States. There will only be a problem with United Kingdom because... Of the spelling of other words such as behavior, color, color with a U, and then behavior also with a U. So I, I also have Filipino keyboard, but I uh, rarely use it. And then I have, as I've said, um, if you want to explore more the system, handwriting system, or the writing system of other languages, you can add additional language packs. So I installed the Japanese and Korean. So let's have an example. So let's open an app. So example, Microsoft Word. Okay, so as you can see, if, if it, um, okay. Okay, let's, uh, okay. So actually, uh, in the earlier versions, such as um, um, XP and below, and uh, they really um, do not uh, support other languages. So, but if you're, for example, you're in Japan, so automatically the Windows that will be deployed there would be Japanese version, and you don't have the 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 English version. So that's why, example, you have um, um, relatives that uh, that ha had lived in Japan, and then they give you their laptops um sometimes most of the case they have to reinstall it with the english version because the the operating the windows version the language that it you it used is japanese so since this is the default language that we are uh, that we have so english so you have to click japanese and then also its default is in uh, romanized version so that will be so for example um i want to write my name so uh for you to have this additional language pack um it, i think it is a prerequisite that you need to know how to read and write because if you don't know uh of, of course the meaning of that word or you don't have a limited or you don't know any uh japanese vocabulary it will be difficult for you so my name for example uh, my name can be represented in in Japanese or in Nihongo um, because Arada sounds like Japanese and my name um, it actually is a literal meaning meaning white flower so for Arada so it's just an example so a ah, then da then da so we have actually it's already in here so uh, huh okay Okay, so that's arada. So for uh, this is um, ara, then da. Okay, if, if actually if you're going to press space, um, it will change. So that's the 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 way on how to um, change. Um, this is uh, actually Japanese has three writing systems. So they have hiragana, then kat hiragana for Japanese native words, katakana for 
uh, foreign words. And we have kanji. These are Chinese characters, ideograms or ideographs. So later on. So actually, this one is hiragana. So because it sounds Japanese, I, I, I can write it in hiragana. Then um, if I'm going to press um, space, so it will be automatically con converted into kanji. This is a Chinese character. So actually, uh, the uh, uh, arada means in Japanese is new field. Okay, this is new and then this is the field. And then my name, okay, let's, okay, uh-huh, uh-huh. Okay, then my name, which is Blanca Flor, which is a literal meaning of white flower. So we have Shiro. So that's Shiro. Okay. Shiro means white. That's the symbol for white. This is also used by um, Chinese for white. And then Hana. Hana in Japanese. Uh, Hana is flower in English. So, this is the symbol for flower. This is also used in Chinese. So, if you have a medication, the white flower, you can see this symbol. So, um, kanji is an ideogram or ideograph, meaning by means of this one, um, it's like, um, it's a single character. It has many strokes, but it already conveys meaning. So, this means white. This means flower. This means rice field or rice paddy. And this means new. So, that's the meaning of the, uh, the, the word. As I said again, you can have, you can do, or you can uh, uh, manipulate uh, this language uh, in using word if you know how to read and write in Japanese or in Nihongo. And then, of course, we can have greetings such as Ohayo, Ohayo, Gozaimasu, and then period. So, uh, this is the, okay, if you want to complete it, so we have Ohayo Gozaimasu. So, that's meaning good morning, and then Otan, Joby oh, 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 me de to, oh, me de to, gozaimasu, ah, gozaimasu, okay, so this is the suggestion with, including with the kanji, so, omedeto, uh, otanjobi omedeto gozaimasu means happy birthday. So, you can already print this. It will be printed as it is if you want to print it in your paper. So, it is really possible. So, that's uh, the good thing with uh, language packs and thanks to Unicode because it can already um, present or it can already um, decode other languages. So I have another one here, of course, um, Korean, which is the Hangul. But uh, unfortunately, I am not yet well versed with the Hangul. So I need to master it so that uh, I can read and write um, uh, in the Korean handwriting or in the writing system. So, so much for. So as I've already uh, demonstrated, so Windows 10 can already support different languages it can already decode even though you don't again even though you don't uh, download the language pack um it will still recognize japanese chinese or korean characters because it does already have the unicode but if you want to type such as i've done in this uh, example um you can um you, you you must download this additional language packs so again let's return to our lesson so next is another design principles of Windows 10 is we have energy efficiency. So for portable devices and others includes dynamic tick feature. For dynamic tick, this is to stop the system timer to um, conserve power. We have also the process lifetime management. We have the desktop activity monitor and then we also have the connected standby. This is a feature for devices, for example, if you have a device that is connected but is idle, so it will consume a little power, but if it is, it will be used, that device that is connected to the computer, then 
um, you don't need to connect and then disconnect it or vice versa. But it will be again in operational state whenever it is needed. Okay, next is we have the uh, Windows 10 architecture. So again, Windows 10 is a layered system of module. We have the protected mode. We have the hardware abstraction layer or the HAL. So it is a kernel layer that isolates chipset specific hardware aspects from general purpose code. And then aside from HAL is we have the kernel and executive. And then we have user mode. It is a collection of subsystems. So these subsystems, we have environmental subsystems emulate different operating systems and protection subsystems provide security functions so this is the depiction of a windows 10 architecture as it is said it is a multi-layered uh with uh, with modules so we have for hardware and then the hypervisor or the virtual machine uh, this is used for the virtual machines and then we have the hardware abstraction layer and then for this we have the executive layer and then we have a dynamic uh, library for NT and then subsystem DLLs and then we have for this we have the environment subsystem, system processes, services and applications. So this is an illustration of how is Windows 10 is stacked or formed. Okay, next is we have the system components. So, layered system of modules operating at specific privileged layers. So, kernel and user mode, of course, as we have already, as, uh, as far as chapter one, I've already differentiate, uh, the dif uh, the dif differentiate kernel and user mode. We also have this virtual trust levels option implemented by Hyper-V virtualization. So, VTLs enables virtual secure mode. We have normal world or VTL0 and secure world, VTL1. Within each world are user and kernel modes. The secure world has a secure kernel and executive and a collection of trustlets or uh, secure, uh, secure, secured applications. And then bottommost layer runs in special processor mode. We have the VMX root mode on Intel, including Hyper-V hypervisor, creating hardware-based normal to secure world boundary. So next is the system components is we have the kernel. So foundation for the executive and the subsystems. It is never paged out of memory. Execution is never preempted for kernel. So it will... Um, uh, it will not be preempted by any other ex uh, process. So four main responsibilities of kernel is we have the thread scheduling, the interrupt and exception handling, low level processor synchronization, and recovery after a power failure. So kernel is object oriented, uses two sets of objects. So these two sets of objects are the dispatcher objects control dispatching and synchronization such as events, mutants, mutexes, semaphores, threads, and timers. And then we have another one, which is control objects. Examples of these control objects are asynchronous procedure calls, interrupts, power notify, power status, process and profile objects. So VSM enclave, so VSM is virtual secure mode, allow valid signed third-party code to perform crypto calculations. So for kernel, process and threads. So the process is a virtual memory address space. So it also has an information such as base priority and an affinity for one or more processors. And threads are the unit of execution scheduled by the kernel's dispatcher. So this threads has its own state, including a priority, processor affinity, and accounting information. So a thread can be one of eight states. So it can be in initializing, it can be in ready, deferred ready, standby, running, waiting, transition, and terminated. So each thread has two modes of execution. We have the user mode thread, and then we have the kernel mode thread. So user mode thread is UT and kernel mode thread is KT. 
So each uh, thread has two stacks, one for each mode. And then kernel layer runs trap handler to switch stacks and change CPU mode from user mode to kernel mode or vice versa. So for scheduling by the kernel, so the dispatcher uses a 32 level priority scheme to determine the order of thread execution. So priorities are divided into two classes. So the real time class contains threads with priorities ranging from 16 to 31. And the variable class contains threads having priorities from 0 to 15. So the characteristics of Windows 10's priority strategy, so trends to give very good response times to interactive threads that are using the mouse and window. So that's why so they have this real-time class. So the priorities of this to have a uh, res good response times is they have uh, priorities ranging from 16 to 31. And enables I.O. bound threads to keep the I.O. devices busy. And complete bound threads soak up the spare CPU cycles in the background. So scheduling can occur when a thread enters the ready or wait state, when a thread terminates, or when an application changes a thread's priority or processor affinity. And then real-time threads are given preferential access to the CPU because real-time this uh, pertains to an interaction with the user, but Windows 10 does not guarantee that a real-time thread will start to execute within any particular time limit, so this is known as soft real-time. Okay, we have here a table of Windows x86 interrupt request levels or interrupt request IRQ. So for this table, for let's go first with the bottom most part. So interrupt level 0 is passive. That's the type of interrupt. Then for uh, level 1, a synchronous procedure call or APC. And then 2 is for dispatch and deferred procedure call or DPC. It is intended for the kernel. And then from 3 to 26, this is the traditional PC IRQ. As I've said, interrupt request hardware interrupts. And then level uh, 27 is for the profile. 28 is for the clock. This is used to keep track of time. And then we have level 29. It is inter-process notification. Examples of this are request another processor to act as a dispatch in a process or update the translation look aside buffer. And then for level 30, it is for power fail. And then level 31 is machine check or bus error. So next is how does the kernel uh, implement the trap handling? So the kernel provides trap handling when exceptions and interrupts are generated by hardware or software. So exceptions that cannot be handled by the trap handler are handled by the kernel's exception dispatcher. So the interrupt dispatcher in the kernel handles interrupts by I calling either an interrupt service routine such as in a device driver or an internal kernel routine. And then the kernel uses spin locks that reside in global memory to achieve multiprocessor mutual execution, exclusion rather. So next is we have the executive. So executive has object manager. So Windows 10 uses objects for all its services and entities. The object manager supervises the use of all the objects. So this object manager, of course, generates an object handle. It also checks security and keeps track of which processes are using each object. So objects are manipulated by a standard set of methods, namely create, open, close, delete, query name, parse, and security. So for naming objects, so the Windows 10 executive allows almost any object to be given a name which may be either permanent or temporary. Exceptions are process, thread, and some others uh, are object types. And then object names are structured like file path names in MS-DOS and Unix. And then Windows 10 implements a symbolic link object, which is similar to symbolic links in Unix that allows multiple nicknames or aliases to refer to the same file. 
and then a process can get gets an object handle by creating an object by opening an existing one or by receiving a duplicated handle from another process or by inheriting a handle from a parent process and then each object is protected by an access control list so for virtual memory manager under executive so the design of the virtual machine manager assumes that the underlying hardware supports virtual to physical mapping, a paging mechanism, transparent cache coherence on multiprocessor systems, and virtual addressing aliasing. So the VM manager in Windows 10 uses a page-based management scheme with, what, with whatever page sizes are supported by the hardware. So it can be 4 kilobyte, 2 megabyte, or 1 gigabyte, as big as that. And then the Windows 10 VM Manager uses a two-step process to allocate memory. So the first step is uh, reserves a portion of the process's address space. And then the second step commits the allocation by assigning space in the system's paging file or files. So this is the virtual memory layout. So as we can see, for example, for the page directory pointer table, we have, um, in this example, we have, four pointers, pointer 0 and pointer 3, and then pointer two, two, uh, 0 um, points to a page directory, the same index for the pointer 0, so page directory 0, and it has page directory entry from 0 to 511, and then for this example, page directory 0, page to a page table, the same index, and then this page table has page table entry 0 up to 511. And then this points to a 4 kilobyte page. The same as with uh, on the right side, um, it's it really just the same. An example also. So they have the same um, um, index. So pointer 3, page directory 3. Okay, it also has entries from 0 to 511 for this one. Um, this page directory entry 511 points to page table, the same index 511. And then this page table entry 0 to 511 have their own set of um, 4 kilo, kilobyte page. So that is the virtual memory layout of Windows 10. So the virtual address translation in Windows 10 uses several data structures. So each process has a page directory that contains 1,024 page directory in entries of size 4 bytes. And then each page directory entry points to a page table which contains 1,024 page table entries, PTEs, of size 4 bytes. And each PTE points to a 4 kilobyte page frame in physical memory as illustrated in the previous slide. And then a 10-bit integer can represent all the values from 0 to 1023. Therefore, can select any entry in the page directory or in a page table. So this property is used when translating a virtual address pointer to a byte address in physical memory. So a page can be in one of six states. It can be valid, it can be zeroed, free standby, modified, and bad. So we have an illustration here of virtual to physical address translation on IA32. So IA means Intel Architecture 32, 32 bit. So that's why it's 32. So we have here two bits indexed into four PDEs. Okay, so page directory entry. So two bits PTR, it means pointer. And then 9 bits for page directory entry. So this is the PDE. And then 9 bits for page table entry. So that's why we have this PTE. 9 um, bits. And then 12 bits for byte offset in page. So this is 12. So 0 to 31 bits. Okay, next is we have the 32 bit. How about for uh, 64 bit? So for here, V is equal to 0, T is equal to 0, and P is equal to 0. Then we have 5 bits for page protection. And then 32 bits for, um, this is the 32 bits uh, page file offset. And then frame address. 
Okay, then 4 bits to selecting a page file and 20 bits for additional bookkeeping. So this is the difference between 32-bit and 64-bit. Of course, 64-bit has larger um, page file than 32-bit. Okay, next is we have under executive again, we have the process manager. So, provide services for creating, deleting, and using threads and processes. Issues such as parent or child relationships or process hierarchies are left to the particular environmental subsystem that owns the process. And then processes represented by job object. And then the Docker container support via job objects. So, these job objects are called silos. So, for local procedure call facility of the executive, so, the LPC, again, the local procedure call, passes requests and results between client and server processes within a single machine. And when an LPC channel is created, one of three types of message passing techniques must be specified. So, these three uh, message passing techniques, first type is suitable for small messages up to 256 bytes. Ports, a message queue is used at a, as intermediate storage and the messages are copied from one process to the other. The second type avoids copying large messages by pointing to a shared memory section object created for the channel. And last but not the least, the third method called Quick LPC was used by graphical display portions in the Win32 subsystem. So, another under uh, executive is we have the I.O. manager. So, the I.O. manager is responsible for file systems, cache management, device drivers, and network drivers. It also keeps track of which installable file systems are loaded and manages buffers for I.O. requests. So, I.O. managers works with VM manager to provide memory mapped file I.O. It also controls the Windows 10 cache manager which handles caching for the entire I.O. system. Supports both synchronous and asynchronous operations, provide timeouts for drivers, and has mechanisms for one driver to call another. Okay, we have an illustration here of a file input-output. So, when the I.O. manager receives a file's user-level read request, the I.O. manager sends an IRP to the I.O. stack for the volume on which the file resides. For files that are marked as cacheable, the file system calls the cache manager to look up the requested data in the cache file views. Okay, then the cache manager calculates which entry of that file's VACB or the virtual address control block index array corresponds to the byte offset of the request. The entry either points to the view in the cache or is invalid. If it is invalid, the cache manager allocates a cache block and the corresponding entry in the VACBN array and maps the view into the cache block. And then the cache manager then attempts to copy data from um, the map file to the caller's buffer. If the copy succeed, um, the operation is completed. If the copy fails, uh, it does so because of a page fault, which causes the memory manager to send a non-cached read request to the I.O. manager. Um, the I.O. manager sends another request down the driver's stock, this time requesting a paging operation, which bypasses the cache manager and um, reads the data from the file directly into the page allocated for the cache manager. And then um, upon completion, the VACB is set to point at the page. The data, now in the cache, um, are copied to the caller's buffer and the original I.O. request is completed. So that is the illustration for the file I.O. operation. So next is we have under executive is the security reference monitor. So the object-oriented nature of Windows 10 enables the use of a uniform mechanism to perform runtime access validation and audit, audit checks for every entity in the system. So whenever a process opens a handle to an object, the security reference monitor checks the process's security token 
and the object's access control list to see whether the process has the necessary rights. So for security token, this is token associated um, with each process containing the SIDs or the security IDs of the user and the user's groups, the user privileges, the integrity level of the process, the attributes and claims associated with the user and, um, and any relevant capabilities. So another under executive is we have the plug and play manager. So the plug and play or the PNP manager is used to recognize and adapt to changes in the hardware configuration. When new devices are added, such as PCI or USB, as I've said, for USB, if it is um, or firstly that is uh, inserted into the computer system or connected, then it will provide, uh, the, uh, as I've said in, this, this, uh, in the description here in the slide, the PNP manager loads the appropriate driver since it is a USB. So regarding of the brand, it will be labeled as a USB storage device. And then the manager also keeps tracks of the resources used by each device. So another one is we have the power manager under executive. It detects current power conditions, puts system to sleep and hibernation, and then processor power manager for core parking. So core parking is example, you have an application that can run in just one core of your processor. What if your core, if your processor has four cores? And as I've said, that application can only can on, can can run only in one processor. So the other three processor can rest, can be idle or low low power consumption because uh, instead of using the four cores for just one application that can be processed by this uh, one core, so it will save uh, it will save and conserve power. And then CPU throttling. So throttling means um, you're going to slow down your um, PC's performance to save power. So this is very important for um, mobile computers such as laptops because, of course, they have batteries with them. So this is the a characteristic to slow down the performance of the computer, just not to um, compromise or jeopardize its functionality. So to conserve, again, CPU throttling is used for um, uh, conserve power. And of course, boosting, of course, it is used for gaming because gaming is graphic intensive. It needs uh, a very powerful CPU to render. And also another, aside from the CPU, is we have the graphics processing unit, its own GPU, uh, aside from the CPU, so that um, the CPU will not be loaded of the, of course, of the graphic intensive, especially if the games, of course, are, are graphic intensive and it requires um, rendering of this um, uh, 3D, 3D games. And then aside from uh, this one is we have also the device state management. So next is we have exec, uh, under executive is we have the registry. So configuration information is kept in internal repositories called hives and then managed by configuration manager called registry. I've already shown you how to go to the registry, but of course, um, if you're going to modify it, modify it on your own risk. You, uh, you should know what you've been doing. And then next is separate hives for system information, each user's preferences, software instructions, information, security, and boot options. And Windows creates system restore point before making registry changes, of course. Uh, why? Because to be able to recover previous registry if something goes wrong. So that's why if you're going to change your registry, do it at your own risk and you know what you are doing. But again, Windows has this mechanism of system restore point. But of course, um, you... Please, it's not don't trust system restore point, especially for registry. If you don't know what you're doing, then don't modify the system registry. Okay, next is we have the booting. So booting, so Windows starts booting via BIOS firmware. So actually, this is already old version of uh, booting. And now, 
um, Windows 10 already uses the UEFI, so includes secure boot feature that provides integrity checking via digital signature verification of all firmware and boot time components. And included also in the firmware, uh, it does the power on self-test or the post. What is post? It means that just by turning on the, compute, uh, the computer, the computer itself is already diagnosed, diagnosing itself if it has errors. So that's why power on self-test. And then if machine is hibernating, so hibernating, um, sleep is different from hibernating. Sleep is, uh, if you're, example, if your laptops, it, it's mostly done in laptops. If you're going to close the lid, um, the default state for that is sleep. Meaning, um, there's still an indicator, if you're, the indicator is an LED indicator, that it's, uh, it's not really blinking. Um, it means that the system is still on. Um, you did not shut it down. Of course, it only just sleep. While hibernating, it's a form of sleep, but it really shuts down your, um, it, it really shuts down your computer. And then when you turn it again, then it will restore to where you left off. That is the hiber hibernate. So, if machine is hibernating, let's continue. State restored via the WinResume.EFI program. And then for booting, kernel initializes, starts several processes including the idle process, system process, secure system process, and session manager sub system. Okay, next is we have the file system. So, the fundamental structure of the Windows 10 file system is NTFS. It is uh, NTFS, which is its um, structure is a volume. It's called a volume. It is created by the Windows 10 Disk Administrator Utility. It is based on a logical disk partition. It may occupy portions of a disk, an entire disk, or span across several disks. So, mainly... It can be a part of a disk. It depends upon if it has a partition or the entire disk or as across several disks. So, it depends upon the setup. So, all metadata such as information about the volume is stored in a regular file. So, NTFS uses, uses clusters as the underlying unit of disk allocation. A cluster is a number of disk sectors that is a power of two. 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, 1, 2, 8, so on and, and so forth. So because the cluster size is smaller than that for the 16-bit FAT, the old file system of Windows, the amount of internal fragmentation is reduced. So how about the internal layout of the file system? So NTFS uses logical cluster numbers or LCNs as disk addresses. A file in NTFS is not a simple byte stream as in MS-DOS or UNIX. Rather, it is a structured object consisting of attributes. Every file in the NTFS is described by one or more records in an array stored in a special file called the master file table or the MFT. And then each file on an on a NTFS volume has a unique ID called a file reference. So, it is a 64-bit quantity that consists of a 48-bit file number and a 16-bit sequence number. So, file reference can be used to perform internal consistency checks for the file. And then, the NTFS namespace is organized by a hierarchy of directories. The index root contains the top level of the B plus tree. So, how about uh, recovery in terms of file system? So, all file system data structure updates are performed inside transactions that are logged. So, before a data structure is altered, the transaction writes a log record that contains redo and undo information. And then after that, the date after the data structure has been changed, a commit record is written to the log to signify that the transaction succeeded. Uh, what, what happens if there is a crash? So, after a crash, the file system data structures can be restored to a consistent state by processing the log records or log. For us, it's a record. 
So next is this scheme does not guarantee that all the user file data can be recovered after a crash. So it's not 100% effective, just that the file system data. So, uh, so that's why it's very important to save the, uh, you, uh, the file data, the, the file that is used by the user. Because sometimes if you don't save it manually and then your system crashes, uh, unfortunately, there are times that you cannot recover those changes. So that's why you have to save your file always. Because um, this scheme only guarantees the uh, safety of file system data. Uh, specifically data structures such as the metadata files are undamaged and reflect some consistent state prior to the crash. The log is stored in the third metadata file at the beginning of the volume. So the logging functionality is provided by the Windows 10 log file service. So how about security in the file system? So security of an NTFS volume is derived from the Windows 7 object model. So it is already it is adopted from Windows 7. It's still used in Windows 10. Each file object has a security descriptor attribute stored in the NFT on this MFT record. So this attribute contains the access token of the owner of the file an access control list that states the access privileges that are granted to each user that has access to the file. So next is we have volume management and fault tolerance. So FD disk or the fault tolerant disk driver for Windows 10 provides several ways to combine multiple SCSI disk drives into one logical volume. So logically, concatenate multiple disks to form a large logical volume or a volume set. Then next is interleave multiple physical partitions in round-robin fashion to form a stripe set. So it is familiar, it is same or also called RAID level 0 or disk striping. So another variation of this is stripe set with parity or RAID level 5. And then you can also do the disk mirroring or RAID level 1. It's a robust scheme that uses a mirror set, two equally sized partitions on two disks with identical data contents. So if this disk one is damaged, you can use the copy of, uh, of disk one, which is disk two, for, an ex for instance. So to deal with disk sectors that go bad, FD disk uses a hardware technique called sector sparing. So sector sparing means... Um, you have an additional sector. Once this is considered bad sector, it will use that particular spare sector that it's assigned to the bad, bad sector and the files from this bad sector will be transferred from that spare sector. And then another, NTFS uses a software technique called cluster remapping. Since the sector is already identified as bad, so again, um, the data will be transferred to another sector and then there will be a, a cluster remapping to, uh, to not include that uh, bad sector anymore for storing files. Of course, it's already a bad sector. Why would you place data there? It will be damaged. So that's why there is cluster remapping. Okay, next is we have compression for file system. So to compress a file, NTFS divides the file's data into compression units, which are blocks of 16 contiguous clusters. For sparse files, so NTFS uses another technique to save space. So for this, clusters that contain all zeros are not actually allocated or stored on disk. Instead, gaps are left in the sequence of virtual cluster numbers stored in the NF MFT entry of, for the file. And then when reading a file, if a gap in the virtual cluster numbers is found, NTFS just zero fills that portion of the color's buffer. So next is we have the reparse points for the file system. So a reparse point returns an error code when accessed. So the reparse data tells the I.O. manager what to do next. And then reparse points can be used to provide the functionality of Unix mounts. Reparse points can also be used to access files that have been moved to offline storage. So next is we have uh, Windows 10, of course, has networking capabilities. So Windows 10 supports both peer-to-peer -peer or P2P and client-server networking. 
It also has facilities for network management. To describe networking in Windows 10, we refer to two of the internal networking interfaces. We have the NDIS or the, and the TDI. So NDIS stands for Network Device Interface Specification. It separates network adapters from the transport protocol so that either can be changed without affecting the other. And then another one is we have the TDI or the Transport Driver Interface. It enables any session layer component to use any available transport mechanism. So Windows 10 implements transport protocols as drivers that can be loaded and unloaded from the system dynamically. So for the protocols of networking, so it uses Windows 10, the server message block or the SMB protocol is used to send IO requests over the network. It has four message types. So we have session control, file, printer, and message. So for session control, these are commands that uh, start and end a redirector connection to a shared resource at the server. While the file, um, these are used to access files at the server. And then printer is used to send data um, to a remote print queue and to receive status information from the queue. And last but not the least is we have the message. Um, these are used to communicate with another workstation. So we have also the Network Basic Input-Output System or the NetBIOS. It is a hardware abstraction interface for networks. So this is used to establish local logical names on the network. Another is establish lo logical connections of sessions between two logical names on the network and supports reliable data transfer for a session via NetBIOS requests or SMBs. So Windows uses also the TCP IP Internet Protocol version 4 and 6 to connect to a wide variety of operating systems and hardware platforms. It also uses the PPTP or the point-to-point -point tunneling protocol so this is used to communicate between remote access server modules running on Windows machines that are connected over the internet. Another one, it also uses the data link control protocol or the DLC. It is used to access IBM mainframes and HP printers that are directly, directly connected to the network and possible on 32-bit only versions using unsigned drivers. So access to a remote file. So the application, this is the process. The application calls the IO manager to request that a file be opened. So we assume that the file name is in standard UNC format. Next, the IO manager builds an IO request packet. And then next, the IO manager recognizes that the file is for a remote file. So it's not really stored on the local or physical disk and calls a driver called the Multiple Universal Naming Convention Provider or the MUP. So the MUP sends the I.O. request packet asynchronously to all registered redirectors. And then a redirector that can satisfy the request response to the MUP. So to avoid asking all the redirectors, of course, it's what if your redirectors is um, more than 10 or it's 100. So every time, uh, that you need it, you have to ask all of them. So, to avoid traffic in the network. So, to again, to avoid asking all the redirectors the same question in the future, the MUP uses a cache to remember with reader, which redirector can handle this file. So, the redirector sends the network request to the remote system, and then the remote system network drivers receive the request and pass it to the server driver. And then the server driver hands the request to the proper local file system driver. And then the proper device driver is called to access the data. And then the results are returned to the server driver, which sends the data back to the requesting director. Then it will be returned um, to where the request uh, is uh, a request happened. Okay, next is we have the domains in networking. So window, Windows uses the concept of a domain to manage global access rights within groups. 
So a domain is a group of machines running Windows that share a common security policy and user database. So Windows provides three models of setting up trust relationships such as one-way, A trusts B. We have also two-way, transitive, A trusts B, and B trusts C. So A, B, C trust each other. And then also we have cross-link allows the authentication to bypass hierarchy to cut down on authentication traffic. So how about name resolution in TCP IP networks? So on an IP network, name resolution is the process of converting a computer name to an address, IP address. Such as we have an example here, the belllabs.com resolves to this IP address. And then Windows provides several methods of name resolution. It can be done by means of Windows Internet Name Service or WINS. It can also be done using the broadcast name resolution, a domain name system or DNS, a host file or the LM hosts file. LM host stands for LAN Manager Host. So WINS consists of two or more WINS servers that maintain a dynamic database of name to IP address bindings and client software to query the servers. And then Win also uses the dynamic host configuration protocol or the DHCP, which automatically updates address configurations in the Win's database without user or administrator intervention. So next is we have the programmer interface. So how to access the uh, to kernel object. So a process gains access to a kernel object named example triple x by calling create triple x function to open a handle to triple x the handle is unique to that process so a handle can be closed by calling the close handle function the system may delete the object if the count of processes using the object drops to zero so windows provides three ways to share objects between processes so it's either a child process inherits a handle to the object. Another, one process gives the object a name when it is created and the second process opens that name. And then we have another one, the duplicate handle function. So given a handle to process and the handle's value, a second process can get a handle to the same object and thus share it. So next is we have process management for programmer interface. So process is started via the create process routine, which loads any dynamic link libraries that are used by the process and creates a primary thread. Additional threads can be created by the create thread function. And then every dynamic link library or executable file that is loaded into the address space of a process is identified by an instance handle. So next is a continuation with process management. So, scheduling in Win32 utilizes uh, four priority classes. Actually, it's six. So, number one is we have idle priority class. It is priority level four. Then we have below normal priority class, empty level, priority level six. And then we have the normal priority class, which is level eight, typical for most processes. We have the above normal priority class, it's level 10. High priority class is level 13. Real-time priority class is level 24. The higher the level, the higher the priority. So to provide performance levels needed for interactive programs, Windows has a special scheduling rule for processes in the normal priority class. So this special scheduling rule is distinguishing before, between rather the foreground process that is currently selected on the screen and the background processes that are not currently selected. This is my example, for example, uh, for this, my system. I open up my PowerPoint presentation, the slideshow presentation software and the uh, Word document. Since I'm actively using the slideshow presentation, so that is the foreground process. So, Windows will give priority to the foreground process because it is where the, the user is currently using that uh, software while the other one, which is the Word document, it is a background process. So it will not currently be selected. But of course, if I switch to Microsoft Word, Microsoft Word will be the uh, foreground process. 
And another one, the special scheduling rule, when a process moves into the foreground, increases the scheduling quantum by some factor, typically 3. So the kernel dynamically adjusts the priority of a thread depending on whether it is I.O. bound or CPU bound. To synchronize the concurrent access to shared objects by threads, the kernel provides synchronization objects such as semaphores and mutexes. So in addition, threads can synchronize by using the wait for single object or wait for multiple objects functions. So another method of synchronization in the Win32 API is the critical section. So next is we have a fiber is a user mode code that gets scheduled according to a user-defined scheduling algorithm. Only one fiber at a time is permitted to execute even on multiprocessor hardware. And then Windows includes fibers to facilitate the porting of legacy Unix applications that are written for a fiber execution model. So Windows also introduced user mode scheduling for 64-bit systems which allows finer grain control of scheduling work without requiring kernel transitions. So we have, a, we have an illustration here of user mode scheduling. So for this one, um, UMS provides an alternative model by recognizing that each Windows thread is actually true threads. Uh, it is a kernel thread or KT and um, a user thread, UT. Each type of thread has its own stack and its own set of saved registers. The KT and UT appear as a single thread to the programmer because UTs can never block but must always enter the kernel where an implicit switch to the corresponding KT takes place. Um, UMS uses each UT's TEB to uniquely identify the user mode thread. When UT enters the kernel, an explicit switch is made to the KT that corresponds to the UT, identified by the current TEB. The reason the kernel does not know which UT is running is that um, UTs can invoke a user mode scheduler as fibers do. But in UMS, the scheduler switches UTs including switching the TEBs. Um, when a UT enters the kernel, its KT may block. When this happens, then the kernel switches to a scheduling thread, which UMS calls a primary thread and uses this thread to re-enter um, the user mode scheduler so that it can pick another UT to run. Eventually, a block KT will complete its operation and be ready to return to user mode. Since UMS has already re-entered the user mode scheduler to run a different UT, um, UMS queues the UT corresponding to the completed KT to a completion list in user mode. Um, when the user mode scheduler is choosing a row, or rather a new UT to switch to it, it can examine the completion list and treat only UT um, on the list as a candidate for scheduling. So that is the description for this um, picture of the user mode scheduling. So another one is we have the inter-process communication for programmer interface. So Win32 applications can have inter-process communication by sharing kernel objects. An alternate means of inter-process communication is message passing, which is particularly popular for Windows GUI applications. So one thread sends a message to another thread or to a window, and then a thread can also send data with the message. Every Win32 thread has its own input queue from which the thread receives messages. So this is more reliable than the shared input queue of 16-bit windows because with separate queues, one stack applications cannot block input into the other applications. So how about memory management in the programmer interface? So we have virtual memory, we have virtual alloc or virtual allocation, reserves or commits virtual memory, then we have virtual free, decommits or releases the memory. So these functions enable the application to determine virtual address at which the memory is allocated. An application can use memory by memory mapping a file into its address space. So it is a multi-stage process. And another, two processes share memory by mapping the same file into their virtual memory. And then next, 
A heap in the Win32 environment is a region of reserved address space. So a Win32 process is created with a 1 megabyte default heap. And access is synchronized to protect the heap's space allocation data structures from damage by concurrent updates by multiple threads. So because functions that rely on global or static data typically fail to work properly in a multi-threaded environment, the thread local storage mechanism allocates global storage on a per-thread basis. So this mechanism provides both dynamic and static methods of creating thread local storage. So this is all about Windows 10. So you've learned the different characteristics and features of Windows 10 that is different with other operating systems. So again, this is case study is um, being presented because here, mostly we are using the Windows operating system. So at least we know what are its key features and characteristics of this particular versions of, uh, for version of Microsoft Windows. So if you do have any questions, so please feel free to comment below. And don't forget to subscribe to my YouTube channel. So again, this is the last topic for our operating systems lecture series. So I hope that you've learned something from the duration of our um, lessons that from chapter 1 to 21. So I hope that you remember all the operating con concepts that is learned from this lecture series. So I have nothing to say. So thank you very much. Good day and stay safe.